Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us here on the network where we cover the most interesting live trials and legal stories in the news today. We have multiple trials to cover for you, including one major live trial. So let's break it all down right now. Joining me is criminal defense attorney Holly Waltman. Holly, great to have you here on Law & Crime. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Good morning. Good morning. So you tell me. Is the defense have a good thing here going? Because honestly, they have two people that have already been pled guilty, have already been convicted, already held responsible for the death of Dr. Hatcher. It seems like a good strategy to go after them. What do you think? I think this is a great strategy. It's a sexy theme for his case. I think that George Milner nailed his opening and really hit home about the human instinct and following your gut. I think that uh, I'm intrigued uh, by his opening, and, and I think that this is a solid uh, theory for his case. The problem is you have witnesses who've come forward so far that really have hurt the defense's case. I mean, first you get, uh, let's just talk about the, the cousin that testified that he said Delgado wanted him to take a bat and beat Hatcher. What do you make of that? So we do have some um, less than savory uh, testimony that came out for the state in this case. But again, I think that there is enough um, um, in the fact that two people have already pled guilty to lesser uh, sentences and really are doing anything they can to save any amount of viable life that they may have outside of prison in the future. Well, look, you, you, you know, there, there's Crystal Cortez. She got you know, convicted, excuse me, she pled guilty, 35 years. She gets the sweetheart deal, as the defense called it. But what about Christopher Love? He was the actual trigger man, and Delgado wasn't even there. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely troublesome for the defense. I don't really know how we're going to uh, see uh, George Milner navigate this, but he definitely has uh, a few tough days ahead of him, we should say. He then goes on to say that he was also supposed to hit her with the bat. It's not just to scare her. Now, Holly, what a witness this is. This is a guy who clearly didn't want to be on the stand. Um, that's my opinion. And he says it later on that he doesn't want to be on the stand. You can see how difficult it is for him. This is a family member. I mean, when you talk about credible witnesses, do you think he's credible? I do believe he's credible, Jesse, and I think that that's evident in the fact that he is very hesitant to come forward with the details. I don't know about you, but if someone offered me an amount of money to scare someone or hurt someone, that's not really a detail that I think um, would go by the wayside in my memory. Uh, he is hesitant, and I think that his demeanor really is very uh, telling of his credible nature. Well, talking about uh, what the value is of his testimony, one of the things the defense attorney said, hey, listen, was, Brett, was Kendra Hatcher beaten to death with a bat? No, she was shot. So how valuable is this that you have somebody soliciting or allegedly soliciting somebody to scare or beat somebody with a bat when really this woman was shot dead in a parking garage? Well, and that is a good point, Jesse, and that's something that the defense definitely can hammer in their closing arguments. But I do think it goes to the state of um, mind for Ms. Delgado. I think when you couple it with all of the other circumstantial evidence, uh, the fact that she fled to Mexico once she realized that she was wanted by the FBI, when you couple all of that with every, everyone else's circumstantial evidence, I do think it's very telling. Yeah, consciousness of guilt. That's what we always like to say. And I want your perspective on this. Now, this cross-examination of this witness, I'm not going to lie to you, was a little bizarre, okay? It's a little bizarre, and I'm going to play it for you, and then we're also going to play you the redirect uh, by the state. If you haven't seen this, watch. All right, Holly, lot to break down. Let's start with the cross-examination. My understanding of what he was trying to do was say, hey, you know, there's a difference between a baseball bat and a softball bat. You should have known the difference. You assumed it was a baseball bat when really it was a softball bat. Therefore, you're not credible. Is that what he was trying to do? Because I think I was still lost in the fact that he's holding a bat next to the witness, and I thought at one point he might be smacking him. Jesse, to me, it looked like Martinez. It sent chills down my spine, the way that Martinez was looking at defense attorney. Um, I don't know that it really matters if it's a baseball bat or a softball bat. It doesn't really go to, to his untruthfulness overall. I think it's just an attempt to show maybe 
um, more of his demeanor and see if uh, he'll argue with defense counsel on cross-examination. Juries don't like to hear that. And um, I think that they did a, a, a good job at cross-examining him. But again, yes, that was very bizarre. You, am I wrong to think there was a little bit of like an intimidation factor, a humiliation factor, forcing him to hold the bat? He's standing right next to him. Even at one point, the judge said, take your seat. Am I looking at it the right way? Because I, I felt like a little bit of a weird moment there. No, I mean, we're watching right here. You know, Martinez is, is ducking and, and moving to the side as defense counsel gets close to him. I'm not sure that this was an effective way to cross-examine this witness. I think... Had I been doing this cross-examination, I would have stayed at the podium or a little bit further away when I was actually talking about the difference between a baseball bat versus maybe a softball. And his he, do you think he garnered sympathy from the jury? And if so, that I would imagine that helps the prosecution's case. Oh, absolutely. I felt bad for Martinez. In between his uh, very blank and, and almost eerie stares at defense counsel during um, cross-examination. But no, I did feel bad for him. It, it's a tough spot. He's testifying against his family, and that is never a comfortable moment uh, for anyone involved. I tell you, this was a moment that I will remember from this trial, but that is not the only moment. Because when we come back, we're going to play the testimony of Crystal Cortez, the person we were all waiting for to testify the getaway driver, the woman who pled guilty to the capital murder of Hatcher in exchange for testifying against Delgado. We'll be right back. Holly, her testimony helped secure the conviction of Christopher Love. It's not the first time that we've seen her on the stand, but it is the first time this jury has seen her. What do you think of her? What do you think of how she testifies? I think she testifies very compelling. She is very matter of fact about her answers, and she almost has a very stoic look about herself. I will say, as a defense attorney, um, this may be uh, easier to explain away than, than it might seem right now. Ms. Cortez is testifying for her life. She got a plea deal for 35 years, and she is somewhat expected by this, the prosecution to get up there and testify in accordance with their version of this uh, trial. So while she is compelling and while she is her demeanor and her nonverbal way of testifying is compelling, uh, I do think that a, a good defense attorney and this defense attorney will certainly explain why she seems so compelling in his closing argument. Well, is she compelling? Because the idea is, and look, I don't, there's no perfect way to testify, but she's almost testifying like it's a business transaction. No emotion, no compassion, no sorrow, very matter of fact, tells it like it is, shows very little emotion. Could a jury be turned off by that. Certainly, Jesse, and it's, it's really, you know, a great point that you brought up. This witness has been prepped by the state numerous times. She has practiced this. She probably knows the next question before the prosecutor even asks it. And it does come off a little bit like it has been rehearsed in that way. I don't know that it's enough to completely disregard her testimony altogether, but certainly I'm sure it has uh, turned some of the jurors off. And she's in the hot seat because the defense is pointing the finger at her and saying really she was the person who masterminded this robbery gone wrong and that it wasn't a hit. Let's play more of her testimony from yesterday. One of the things that strikes me, Holly, is so disturbing about this case is the level at which they stalked the victim. You know, the level that they put into tracking her and plotting this out, doing test runs. It's just such a disturbing part of this case, and I'm wondering what the jury's thinking about it. I don't know about it, you or me or anybody else. I don't know how you listen to that testimony and you don't have chills down your back. I mean, this is deeply disturbing and highly calculated. Um, I think that Ms. Cortez is, is pretty lucky to have gotten an offer of 35 years uh, in this case, considering the level that she was involved. And like you said, the intensity in which the planning um, part of this uh, murder went down. Let's talk about that, what would be fair here. So she's 35 years in prison. Christopher Love was sentenced to death. But the person who was ultimately, who's being accused of being ultimately responsible for this is Brenda Delgado. But because, as you said earlier, as we mentioned, due to this extradition agreement, she cannot face the death penalty. If she's convicted, she could spend the rest of her life in prison. Is this fair? You know, I, I practice criminal defense in the state of Georgia and in the South. If you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. And everyone 
that was involved in the <clears throat> premeditation of this murder, as well as the actual execution of it, uh, probably should be receiving the same uh, penalty, in my opinion. And maybe that's the way it is. And look, we're not even there yet because this trial just began. The question is, though, the majority of the evidence that the prosecution has against the defendant is based upon witness testimony. She told me to do this. We agreed to do this. Don't you think there needs to be more physical or maybe, you know, communications detailing what happened? I mean, maybe we'll see that, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. I mean, of course, Jesse, I, I'm sure every prosecutor out there would love more physical evidence in this case. Unfortunately, that's not what we have here. In an ideal world, you have fingerprints, you have a confession, you have triangulation of cell phones, and you have co-defendant's testimony. It doesn't mean that they won't win the day, and I do think that a lot of uh, hurdles will have to be overcome by the defense to get any not guilties on this verdict form. Now, let me ask you real quick, about 20 seconds, would it be beneficial for the defendant to take the stand and tell her side of the story? You know, that is something that is always um, up for speculation. Would it be better? I don't know her story, so to answer that question, I'm not sure. It is something, as a defense attorney, you have to plan for um, your client to testify or not to testify, and also know that during your trial, and if you present any evidence, that decision may change. Right. So it is a very tiptoey type of strategy where um, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure either, but we're going to have to see. We're waiting to go live. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back here on Long Crime. Stay tuned.